All right, good morning and welcome, everyone. You can stand and worship with us if you like. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I can see the clouds rolling. I can feel the wind as they try to shake me. I will not be moved. My feet are on the rock. I can feel the waters rise. I can hear the howling lies that on me. If you won't own me now, my feet are on the rock. And when I feel my hope about to break, I will cling to your unchanging grace. Let the waters come. Away. I'll be dancing in the rain, yeah. My feet are on the rock. Ooh. Ooh. I can see the morning light. I can feel the joy on the horizon. Here my faith is found. Stand on solid ground Can I feel my hope about to break I will cling to your unchanging grace Let the waters come and the earth give way I'll be dancing in the rain My feet are on the rock Clap your hands, our feet are on the rock. Oh, Christ, a solid rock, I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. So stomp your feet and clap your hands, our feet are on the rock. Oh, Christ, a solid rock, I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. So stomp your feet and clap your hands, our feet are on the rock. And when I feel my hope about to break, I will cling to your unchanging let the waters come and the earth give way. I'll be dancing in the rain. Yeah. I feel my hope about to break. I will cling to your unchanging grace. Let the waters come and the earth give way. My feet are on the rock. Ooh. My feet are on the rock. Ooh. My feet are on the rock. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the contemporary service here at Broadmoor. My name is Amber, and I am the worship leader of this service. If this is your first time joining us, we hope you feel the warmest welcome. I want to invite, uh, say good morning to those who are joining us online. If you haven't yet, please fill out a connection card. That just helps us connect to you better. We're going to continue to worship this morning and sing. But right now, I want you to say good morning to your neighbor. Wish them a good morning. Tell them you're glad to see them, and we're going to continue to worship. Amen. All I see is the battle You see my victory When all I see is the mountain You see a mountain more And as I walk through the shadows Your love surrounds me There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. So when I fight, I fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, 
the battle belongs to you and every fear I lay at your feet I sing through the night oh the battle belongs to you If you are for me, who can be against me? For Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. When all I see are the ashes, you see the beauty. When all I see is the cross, God, you see the empty tomb. So when I fight, I fight on my knees with my head lifted high. Oh, God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, I sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. In Almighty Fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. In almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. seated. Here this morning, I'm Donnie Wilkinson. I'm one of the pastors here. We're so grateful that you are with us. Thank you to everyone. If you haven't already, go ahead and uh, let us know you're here by filling out one of the connection cards. While you're doing that, uh, real quick announcement. Next Sunday is our back to school blessing. Every year we set aside time Sunday before, before school starts to pray a prayer of blessing and protection. Uh, not just for the students, but for the teachers and for the administrators and everyone. And so uh, I invite you to come and be a part of that. If you have uh, friends who maybe don't go to church, you can invite, have kids who will be starting school, invite them to come and be a part of that blessing as well. At this time, I want to invite those who are uh, age five through fifth grade. If they want to, they can go to see Connor for Kids uh, Breakout. I want to say a special order of appreciation to Connor. Uh, in addition to doing this every Sunday, he is working with the summer camp all year, did a mission trip last week, color war on Wednesday with all the district youth. And so, Connor, thank you so much for all that you do for the young people in, in our church. I invite you now to, uh, to join with me in setting aside a few moments for prayer. Uh, to come into a comfortable seated position, turn your palms up in your lap, close your eyes, take a few easy, gentle breaths. Gather your scattered senses and just be present to God.
And I invite you to give thanks to God for three personal blessings that you are conscious of and grateful for today. Give thanks to God who is the source of every good and, and perfect gift. With your heart full of gratitude for the blessings that you personally have received, I invite you to pray for, for three people that you know, asking God to bless them. People that you feel need God's blessing in their life, ask God to give them peace, to give them hope, give them strength, to give them courage, to give them healing. Lift them up by name to God our Father. I invite you to ask the Holy Spirit to help you review the past 24 hours to be honest with yourself and honest before God about the mistakes and sins that you have committed, places where you missed the mark. Ask God for forgiveness and ask for the strength to forgive others. I invite you to pray for one person that you have a hard time getting along with. Ask God to give this person insight into their personal problems and to give you the strength to let God's love flow through you to them. I invite you to ask God to give you sensitivity to the needs of one person that you can show God's love to in word or deed today. I invite you to ask God for help with your personal problems. Ask for healing, for hope, for peace. Ask God to reveal to you the next faithful step. I invite you to ask God for help in achieving your goals. Ask God to give you wisdom and insight so that you can continue to progress towards that which you desire to achieve. Finally, I invite you to ask God this most important question and to listen, to listen with everything that you have for God's reply. Lord, what do you want to do? Gracious God, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for these moments of peace and stillness in the midst of our busy and scattered lives. We thank you for the privilege of drawing near to you, for you hearing our prayers, and for you answering. We know that you hear us and that you respond, for this is the promise your son Jesus has given us, 
He said, whatever you ask for by faith in my name, you will hear and answer. And so in the name of Jesus, trusting in your goodness, we offer these our prayers. And together the people of God said, amen. amen. Every week we, uh, we have the opportunity to be a part of what God is doing here through our tithes, gifts, and offerings. I'm going to invite Will Starkey, if he, he will, to come and share with us a little bit about our uh, ministry moment today, talk about Car Church, about something that your gifts helped make possible. Will, come and share with us. Good morning. So a couple weeks ago, we did Car Church, and it, it was a lot of fun. And just wanted to share with you you know, a year and a half ago when we come up with the idea to do this, we had an, a vision to reach people and to help people that could we could have an impact in someone's life. And there's people in here that help with Car Church, and we have a lot of fun in doing that. And I just want to share a little story about a woman named Vanessa. She came to our very first Car Church a year and a half ago, and she's been, every time we've had Car Church, she comes. Well, now she's got involved with a Bible study here at Broadmoor and she wants to come and she wants to be participate and to help and she comes to car church and works the whole time that we're doing car church she comes and works just because of an idea or that we wanted to reach and help someone you never know the impact you can have in someone's life just but just doing the little things amen this past 15th, we did 41 oil changes. Amen. Amen. I didn't help at all because you don't want me under the hood of a car. The reason Will and the other guys and, and ladies who helped were able to do that is because of your uh, generosity. I was asking Will this week, it talks about, about 50 bucks per car to, to service those when you get the oil and the filters and everything and so uh, it's a big undertaking uh, but your generosity is what makes it possible so as those who are assisting with communion uh, assisting with the offering this morning will come forward I want to invite you you've got just a, an extra dollar to bring it out this morning to a, drop it into the plate because that dollar is going to go to ministries like Heart Church and Dinner Church and all the ways that we reach out to people in our community let's pray together Gracious God, we thank you, and we ask now that you will bless and multiply these gifts, for we give them to you in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. And all Creatures of our God and King, lift up your voices with us, sing. Sun, moon, and stars rejoice on high, and praise to the Lord of light divine. Sing hallelujah, and sing hallelujah. Praise the Father above. Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah. For his infinite love. Sing hallelujah. Yeah. 
of our God and King. Lift up your voice and with us sing. Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, praise the Father above. Sing Thank you all so much. Wonderful as always. Um, so at this time, I'm going to invite David Jumper. Where's David? There he is. David's going to come forward uh, as we've been doing uh, each week during this Ten Commandments series, uh, reciting the Ten Commandments together. So I invite you as you're able to please stand and let's join in uh, reciting the Ten Commandments together. Hear these commandments which God has given to his people and examine your hearts. I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods but me. Keep your law. You shall not make for yourselves any idol. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep your law. You shall not dishonor the name of the Lord your God. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep your law. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep your law. Honor your father and mother. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep your law. You shall not commit murder. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts Keep your law. You shall not commit adultery. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep your law. You shall not steal. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep your law. You shall not be a false witness. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep your law. You shall not covet anything which belongs to your neighbor. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep your law. When Jesus was asked, which commandment is the greatest, he replied, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep your law. Beautiful. Thank you. Please be seated. So time for our weekly pop quiz. Today we're talking about the seventh commandment. The seventh commandment is what? All right. So we can do it a little more enthusiastically, maybe. Uh, so I was thinking uh, this week, uh, when we started the church up in Sterlington, one of the guys there, Ronnie, uh, he developed this little bit every Sunday. He would come up to me and say, all right, preacher, what are you preaching on today? And I'd go, sin. And he'd go, all right, are you for it or against it? <laughs> I'm just going to be real honest with you. Uh, reading through the entire Bible. The Bible is 100% unequivocally against uh, adultery. It's recorded here in the Ten, Ten Commandments, uh, two places, Exodus chapter 20, verse 14, and then Deuteronomy 5, 18. As we said, it's almost identical in both locations. Uh, 
The version that we most often read, the New Revised Standard, translates the verse this way, you shall not commit adultery. Eugene Peterson, in his translation of the Bible, known as the Message, uh, gets a little bit closer to how the, to the sentence structure of the book of, and, and the, of uh, the Hebrew language that it was originally written in, where he translates it, no adultery. But just like last week, in the prohibition against murder, I think to really get the, uh, the feel, the form of, of what this text says, it's this. Adultery? No! It's two words. An emphatic declaration. No. When Jesus was asked what the greatest commandment was, what did he say? You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The Ten Commandments, every single one of them, helps us grow in our relationship, our love of God and our love of neighbor. And so uh, last week, as we explored the Sixth Commandment, no murder, uh, we discovered that the Sixth Commandment guards our neighbor's life. So if the Sixth Commandment guards our neighbor's life, what does the Seventh Commandment guard? The Seventh Commandment guards our neighbor's marriage. The Seventh Commandment guards our neighbor's marriage. The prohibition against adultery in the whole Bible, every example, is always about the protection of the family. It's about the protection of of the family. And there's no one who gets a pass on this commandment. No matter how high a political leader is, all, we are all held to the same standard. If someone cannot keep this most basic covenant of trust that they make with a spouse in marriage, they're disqualified from serving uh, as a leader in a community or nation or the world. And I say this not because it's just my belief. It's, it's what the Bible points to here. And it, and it lifts up one of the key characters here. One of the key characters in the Old Testament destroyed their family and ultimately led to the destruction of the nation by committing adultery. I'm talking, of course, about 2 Samuel 11 through 12, where we read about King David's uh, adultery. You might remember the story. Let me read you the first first part of it here, beginning with verse 2 in chapter 11 of 2 Samuel. It happened late one afternoon when David rose from his couch and was walking about on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. David sent someone to inquire about the woman. It was reported, this is Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Now, sometimes when this story is recounted, they try to say that Bathsheba was a willing participant, that she uh, lured David into uh, committing adultery. No, she is the wife of a soldier, not only uh, a soldier, a soldier who's not a Jewish soldier. What, what ethnicity is uh, Uriah? What does it say there? He's a Hittite. So he's someone who is serving in the army, but he is not a native Israelite. So Bathsheba doesn't have a lot of power here. Who does have a lot of power? The king. And what is the king? How does the king use his power? It says so in the next verse. David sent messengers to get her. King shows, sends people to tell you to come to the palace. What are you going to do? You're going to go. And she came to him. And he lay with her. And she returned to her house. David used his power as the king to use someone for his own gratification 
he saw her and she was beautiful and he said, I want her. And used his power and influence to have his way. Now, you know, uh, oftentimes it's not the, uh, the, cha- the uh, consequences that we imagine that get the best of us. It's the consequences that we don't imagine that come back and bite us. Uh, one of those consequences came back and bit David right in the backside here. Because look at the next verse. The woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I'm pregnant. Now, he should have been aware that could have been one of the consequences, but sometimes when one particular part of the body uh, starts thinking, all the other parts of the body shut down. And then uh, that old saying was proven true. In fact, this might be the origin of it. It's never the original crime, it's the cover-up that gets you into trouble. David begins a cover-up of his crime. He wants to, to uh, get himself off of the hook for violating the oath of his office to and, and, and transgressing uh, the marriage of one of his soldiers. So he, he sends to the front line and he brings Uriah back and asks for a report. He says, all right, thanks for the report. You know what? Why don't you go on home and, and go lay with your wife? And uh, Uriah has too much integrity. He says, I, I can't go home and lay in my bed and be with my wife while my brothers are out laying in the field, sleeping in the mud. So David goes, all right, that didn't work. Let me try something else. So he throws a big feast the next day and comes and gets uh, Uriah all boozed up, hoping that with a little relaxation, a little liquid courage, a little liquid uh, response flowing through him, that he might be even more inclined to, to go home. But he does it. So David comes up with another plan. And this plan is uh, sending Uriah with top secret military orders to the commanding general. Uriah doesn't know that he's carrying his own death sentence because the orders said to put Uriah at the front of the battle, the place where the fighting is going to be the most fierce, and then to tell everybody except Uriah that the, the a signal for retreat has been changed. So everybody else hears uh, the trumpet uh, blare and knows to pull back except for Uriah, and he's left there fighting all by himself, and he's struck down, and he is killed. And David thinks, okay, I've gotten away with it. I uh, had a friend who uh, made me a little, uh, little cross-stitch pattern for, uh, for Christmas. It's uh, Jesus. I should, have put, I should have taken a picture of it. It's Jesus kind of peeking around the corner like this, and it said, I saw that. There is always one who sees. There is always one from whom no secrets are hidden. God knows. If you keep reading the rest of chapter 12, you see that God sends the prophet Nathan to uh, let David know that God knows what has happened. Nathan tells this story, and uh, David, uh, is, it's revealed to David that, that he is the one that God is talking about, the one who has violated his trust, who has, who has taken the life of an innocent man so that he could have his own property. And Nathan tells David that this is going to bring down his family. Trouble is going to start in his family from this moment on. If you look at the, 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 the arc of the story of King, King David in chapter in 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel 5, David is made king. Chapter 6, they take the ark of the covenant into the sanctuary and have a huge religious festival. And, and God, God is there with the people in the city. Uh, chapter 7, God makes the divine promise there will always be a descendant of David on the throne of Israel. Chapters 8 through 11 is one military victory after the next. And then chapters 11 and 12. The adultery 
And at that point, David's house begins to crumble. One of his sons rapes his, one of his daughters, and another brother kills the, the first brother. Then uh, one of his other, that same son, Absalom, organizes an insurrection to overthrow his father and to have himself installed as king. David's adultery leads to the destruction of his family. The uh, Food and Drug Administration, when they do uh, testing for, for medicines, uh, sometimes it's a, a medicine that can help people that has to be very, very carefully taken. And if it's severe enough consequences, if there's severe enough risk, they'll put what's called a black box label, black box warning on the medicine. And it says, if you, if you don't use this medicine correctly, it will kill you. It will cause severe side effects. You might see, you might have seen some of those black box warning labels. I think when it comes to adultery, there is a black box warning label. Cover to cover in the Bible, adultery destroys families. Adultery destroys families. This is one of those points where people might say, well, you know, get them, preacher, talking about them. This reminds me of that quote from Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the great Russian writer in the Gulag Archipelago. If only it were so simple, if there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds, and if it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line dividing good from evil cuts through the heart of every human being. And who is willing to destroy a piece of his own heart? Adultery doesn't start with the act. It starts, doesn't start with the genitals. It starts in the heart. And when Jesus was giving us a new way of looking at what it means to be the people of God in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. He talks about this commandment, chapter 5, 27 through 30. You've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, anyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Anyone who looks at another person, not as a human being made in the image and likeness of God, but simply as an object to satisfy one's own sexual desires with, has already crossed the line. It's a matter of the heart. And we live in such a sex-soaked culture that, that we, well, some, I don't know if you ever, you ever had a hard time figuring out what the the ad is trying to get you to buy just because the bodies are everywhere, you know. This, this gift that God has given us of sexuality is a good and a beautiful, beautiful gift for, for having two people to be able to come together as one flesh to, to promote intimacy and, and a building of strong relationships. And then also for the, bringing the beauty of new life into the world. And it can also be, be debased and used as a tool of destruction. Jesus says adultery is a matter of the heart. And then he, he does a little what's known as a prophetic hyperbole. All right, prophetic hyperbole. Uh, hyperbole is making an overstatement to prove a point. I was outside yesterday afternoon. I thought I was literally going to melt. It was so hot. Was it hot yesterday? Absolutely. Was there any chance that I was literally going to melt like an ice cream cone? No. Hyperbole, overstating to make a point. Jesus does that here in the second part of his uh, teaching on adultery in 
in the uh, uh, Sermon on the Mount. Listen to what he says. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Throw it away. It's better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go in to hell. Now, does anybody think that Jesus literally wants us to walk around with just one eye because we plucked it out? Does anybody think Jesus literally wants us to chop off one of our hands? No, it's hyperbole. But it's hyperbole to prove a point. This is something that can wreck your life if you're not careful. It is a good and beautiful gift. But if not used within the bonds that God has created it for and God desires it to, it can wreak utter, utter destruction. One of the things that is... uh, Destroying so many lives, particularly young people, today is, uh, is pornography. And yes, people may not actually commit the deed with another human being. But Jesus tells us, somebody else being there doesn't matter. You've already crossed the line looking with lust. I found this uh, article this past week from uh, Joe uh, Madden in a, uh, an article he wrote back in 2018. And he just wrote, wrote this. Porn works on the brain like any addictive substance. The thing you're addicted to takes hold of your neural circuitry and hijacks the pathways related to more natural rewards so that they become unresponsive. So porn becomes the only thing the brain understands in relations, in relations to sexual stimulation. Basically, real sex becomes increasingly less exciting. And there is a pattern of people moving from more and more and more extreme and graphic, uh, debasing uh, pornography. It's because the the stimulation, uh, everything else pales in comparison. There, there's actually a uh, a malady, a problem. It's called porn-induced erectile dysfunction. It's literally where the parts don't work unless you're looking at porn. So a real live human being right there with you is no longer capable of of stimulating you. Your brain has been so miswired through the indulging of these uh, through indulging of them look um, I remember I was in ninth grade and uh, one of the guys that I was friends with in high school uh, we thought he hit the jackpot he found his uncle's stash of magazines and old VHS tapes we, we thought we thought we had, we had hit the jackpot There's access to billions of hours on this thing that we all carry around. And more and more young people the possibility of them having a normal sex life, healthy sex life is being interrupted because of the bombardment of sex. Videos on uh, even supposedly innocuous social media campaigns, get they, they're constantly pushing the button to see how close can they get before they get banned, before it gets pulled offline. And it starts a cascade that if not arrested, leads to profound sexual dysfunction and ultimately wrecks lives. Over 20 plus years of being a pastor, I've counseled with several families who have, uh, who have dealt with marital problems related to infidelity, adultery. And almost every one of them, the use of pornography plays a huge role in that. 
I think I would be remiss if uh, I didn't share with you uh, something that uh, Adam Hamilton wrote in one of his books about dealing with the reality of lust and dealing with the reality of how do we overcome uh, addiction to pornography and other challenging situations, uh, sexual acting out in ways that is unhealthy and outside God's desire. He calls it the five R's of resisting temptation. And the first is remembering who you are. Remembering that you are a woman, you are a man made in the image and likeness of God. You are not just an animal. You're worth infinitely more. Remember who you are. Second is to recognize the consequences of the action. To recognize the consequences of it. And this is not always easy. Several of the people that I've talked to over my years as a pastor who who have found themselves in inappropriate relationships, almost every one of them woke up one day and realized they had gotten themselves into a situation that they, did, they didn't even know how they got there. It started so innocently. They had to work late a few nights uh, at, at work on this project to meet a deadline, and everybody else was gone, and the conversation was easy, and then before they knew it, they were in a mess. Recognizing the consequences of the action is important. And the moment that you realize you're someplace in danger to bring it to an end, one of the ways to bring it to an end is to rededicate yourself to God. James puts it this way, resist the devil and he will flee from you. To pray for help in the moment of temptation, to pray for help when you find yourself in those situations that are challenging for you to dedicate yourself to rededicate yourself to your to God and rededicate yourself to the one that you made a promise with God uh, with for and this is one that is really challenging but there is incredible freedom comes from it it's reveal your struggle to a trusted friend find Somebody that you can be honest with about, share what you are struggling with. Somebody who will love you, who will not judge you, but will hold you uh, accountable and pray for you. I've got a handful of friends, and we jokingly call ourselves the Mutually Assured Destruction Society. They know my stories, and I know if they ever tell my stories, I've got stories on them. It took a lot of time to build the relationship to the place where we can truly be honest with each other and say, hey, I'm struggling with this. Can you pray for me? I need you to ask me uh, about this. Can you do this for me? And to know that they will, to know that they're not looking with judgment, but rather that they want the best for you and for, for those who are important to you in your life. And the fifth thing is removing the temptation Remove yourself from the tempting situation. That might mean not allowing yourself to be alone with that person. Even if it is innocent, even if it is at work, to always make sure that somebody else is there with you. It might mean removing certain apps from your phone. It might mean making sure that you take advantage of some of the filters and things that are on on the phone that, that are available through technology today to make sure that those aren't uh, those sites aren't accessible on your phone or your computer at home. It seems seems to me that the Bible uh, celebrates God's good gift of human sexuality. It is one of God's great gifts to us, but it is like fire. It is to be used in ways that are in the proper context in the right uh, situation. Otherwise, it can burn down the whole house. And that is celibacy in singleness and fidelity in marriage. That is, uh, seems to be Scripture's prescription for uh, a healthy uh, sexual expression. S celibacy in singleness, fidelity in marriage. And even if, even if, those ideals are not achieved or kept. There's an important story from the Gospel of John that I want us to close with. Gospel John chapter 8, 
where, uh, well, let me just read the story to you. Early in the morning, Jesus came again to the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in what? An adultery. And making her stand before all of them, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? Now, they're, they're quoting uh, not Exodus 20 or Deuteronomy 5, but, but Leviticus 20, 10. If a man commits adultery with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress shall be put to death. She was caught. This is what the, the, the punishment is. Black and white, right? How does Jesus respond? They said this to test him so that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And once again he bent down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the elders. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus straightened up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, sir. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go your way. And from now on, do not sin again. There's no guarantee that a marriage will survive infidelity. It's possible. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of rebuilding trust. It takes the help of a really good therapist who can help you to deal with all of the issues, not just the act and the act of getting over it, but all of the issues that led to it up, led to the acting out in the first place. But even with great therapists and great uh, counseling, there's no guarantee that a marriage will survive infidelity. What is guaranteed is that God's grace is greater than our sin. God's grace that is extended to each and every one of us is extended even to you. That grace which is extended to us whenever we come to this table. We come remembering that Jesus gave his life for sinners. Only sinners. Anybody here a sinner? If your hand's not up, you're lying. That makes you a sinner. Okay? <laughs> At this table, we are reminded of God's infinite grace. Grace that is extended to us even though we don't deserve it. We remember that on the night when Jesus gave himself up for us, he took a loaf of bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave it to them, gave, said, drink from this, all of you. This is the cup of forgiveness. This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Every time you drink from this cup, remember me, remember my love, remember my forgiveness, remember that you have a fresh start. And so we give thanks to God for this bread and for this wine. We give thanks to God for grace that is greater than our sin. Let us pray. Gracious God, pour out your spirit on us gathered here and on this, these gifts of bread and wine. Let them be for us, Christ's body and blood, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Now